Good afternoon, this is Damon Fordham, adjunct professor of history at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And I was asked by a colleague of mine, Professor Melanie Maddox, to speak to her class about my career in history. She's teaching a historiography class, the class in the study of history. But I, fortunately, I wouldn't be there because my, class, my own class is at the same time tomorrow. So I decided that I would do this live stream here so that not only she could see it, but hopefully there's somebody out here who could perhaps learn something from this. So here we go. Well, a little bit about my background. I was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina in December 23rd, 1964 at a segregated clinic. And because I was in an, I was given birth in an unmarried situation in those days, that was considered scandalous. So I was put up for adoption and raised by a couple, Pearl and, Pearl and Abraham Fordham in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And I'm happy to say that I've inherited their house. Now, Mount Pleasant, incidentally, is a suburb of Charleston, which allowed me to have uh, some considerable advantages when it came to exposure to things here in South Carolina. Now, having said all of that, how did I get into the history profession? Well, as a child, I was uh, somewhat considered somewhat strange because I was very unathletic and very awkward. And in those days, people assume, people basically assumed that if you were a young black male, you were good at all things physical and nothing mental, and I was the opposite. It's very bad at sports, and to this day, I have no interest in the subject, even though I've long since outgrown that awkwardness. But anyway, at an early age, I took very well to reading. I remember I had a cousin, uh, I had a couple of cousins. Pamela and John Atta Howard, who would play school with me as a child, and my parents also encouraged me to read when I would eat alphabet soup and form my letters and things like that. And when I was about oh, three or four years old, I remember getting my first children's books, and I took to them, as they say, like duck takes to water. But as time went on, though, I was very fascinated by my father's stories in particular. My dad lived, was born in 1922, and he grew up through the Great Depression, World War II, uh, segregation, and other such things. And he, both he and my mother remembered such things as the Kennedy assassination and other famous things in history that took place during that time period. And often when adults would get together and tell stories in those days, they would send the children out of the room saying, this is grown folks business. But for some reason, my father would talk about a lot of these things in my presence. And I presume it was because he understood that I was learning something. He was a teacher. He taught at Lang High School, segregated black high school in Mount Pleasant. And he was also fairly well read. He had, he had a considerable library that uh, I enjoy reading, mostly science books and things like that. But as time went on, I gravitated toward his stories about his experiences serving in World War II, as well as his stories about growing up in my grandmother's house and the things that he experienced and such. And I would also learn things about people who died long before I was born, such as my grandfather, Abraham Sr., and my mother, as a matter of fact, was pretty good at this, too. She would tell me about my great-grandfather. As a matter of fact, this is this picture right here. An ex-slave named J.B. Maxwell, James Buchanan Maxwell. And she often told the story of how he tried to register, how he would try to register to vote in the 1800s and the hurdles he faced, as well as his owning a store and being a major person in the community and such. So this was filling me already with a pretty good intellectual diet, I guess you could say. And as time went on, there were few things that I loved better than reading. Now, next door to us was a man named Walter Snipe, who we called Papa. And he was born in 1896. And as a child, I was fascinated that I knew this man who was born in the 1800s. And... I think he only had eight years of education, but he was a store owner. He 
worked at the Charleston Naval Shipyard and, in fact, in 1945 invented a ship device. And there's a, there was a local newspaper that did a story about that. But anyway, he had this shed, this tool shed in his backyard where not only did he do his chores and do repairs for people and that sort of thing, he had a lot of books. And one of the books that he had that I really gravitated to was this, Eyewitness the Negro in American History by William Lauren Katz. When I read, I, he would let me go through his books and because he, I suppose he understood where this would eventually lead. And this book was filled with amazing stories about the inventions of black people, the stories of black people, even going back to Africa and such, and the inventions as well as the great leaders and what the great leaders had to say and so forth. And this set my mind on fire because although I was fairly good at elementary school, we were not taught a whole lot about black history. And I later found out why, and I'm going to get in that a little bit later in my conversation. But this was really, this book really set my mind afire as to the possibilities of what could be by learning about all these great leaders. And fortunately, it was a well-written book, so it had a lot of good stories in it, too. And roughly around the same time, across the street from us was a lady named Miss Martha Wilson Jenkins. She was our Den Mother and the Cub Scouts, as well as a very prominent lady in black society and things. And she was a mentee, she was mentee by the great Miss Mary McLeod Bethune. And so she would tell me stories about the great black leader, Miss Mary McLeod Bethune, and black colleges and this sort of thing. And she would have me house sit, even when I was about 10 years old, she would always have me house sit whenever she would go off to various conferences and such. And during one such occasion I was house-sitting, she had this shelf filled with issues of Ebony Magazine, which was, in those days, this magazine that came out once a month and talked about whatever was happening with black people in America and abroad. But one that really stuck with me was this one from August of 1975 called 200 Years of Black Triumphs, Trials and Triumphs. And it had these stories about these people, such as Adam Clayton Powell, Dr. King, and Malcolm X, and Shirley Chisholm, and Sojourner Truth, and Richard Allen, the founder of the AME Church, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the founders of the NAACP, and the, the, particularly his stories about Mar the stories about Marcus Garvey really attracted me. They had this picture of Marcus Garvey addressing this huge hall in Harlem around 1920 or so. And for those of you who don't know, Marcus Garvey was this great Jamaican leader who came to America in 1916. And he preached a message of the solidarity of black people around the world and to form a great super state in Africa. And all of this really fascinated my mind as a child. And so I just took to these books and that was like addiction. I kept reading them and reading them and reading them. And again, a lot of people thought this was strange because quite frankly, I was very awkward as a child. I didn't have much of a social life. I was very skinny, very bad at sports as mentioned earlier. But these type of things were my solace against bullies and older people who thought I was strange and all of that. I would read these things and become very empowered. And little, but the problem was that in those days, nobody really knew that, that this would lead to any sort of career or anything like that. Because again, the expectation was that a black male would do well on, say, the basketball team or the football team or something like that, or get some sort of menial position, or at best, be a teacher like my dad. But there was very little in the way of history teaching in those days in the African American community. So... Again, it was just something that I did, That, but fortunately, my dad in particular encouraged this sort of thing with me. He saw that uh, I had this aptitude for this, and he continued to tell me about his own experiences and all that, and fortunately, I'm happy to have had him in my corner because it served to do me well. Now, in 1976, oh, 77, excuse me, when I was in the sixth grade at Moultrie Middle School in Mount Pleasant, a television movie came out called Roots by Alex Haley. 
and his book on that subject came out about a year earlier. And it dealt with how he went to Africa and found his family and his family's experiences of slavery and how it was passed down through the generations. And in January of 1977, about a month after my 12th birthday, they showed this as a miniseries for the next week or so. Well, it was extremely controversial because it was very graphic for its time and how it dealt with slavery. And it showed how the, it showed how black people were beaten and brutalized and dealt with the mental brainwashing to keep them in an enslaved state, as well as convincing them, again, that they were good at all things physical and nothing mental, so that they'd be good slaves. And a lot of people got, a lot of people, especially young people in those days, were extremely angry at this film over this, watching this film, and this led to a lot of fights and riots and things like that, even at the school that I went to at that time. But I got a different message from this. This made me curious about, you know, not only the, not only the uh, aspect of black history, but the fact that by this time my parents had enough sense to tell me that I was adopted. Because they said that if we don't tell you this now, there are people out there who are ignorant and who would love to make your life miserable with this information. So if we don't tell you now, somebody's going to tell you in the streets. But in those days, it was the identity of your biological parents was kept under lock and key. So I've spent a lot of nights awake, as many adopted people did in those days, wondering who my parents were, what was my background. I mean, all I knew that I was born in this place in Spartanburg at a place called Bull Clinic Hospital and delivered by a Dr. John C. Bull. But beyond that, nothing. Well, anyhow, roots got me interested to learn about uh, my own background as well as about slavery and even more about African-American history and about Africa in particular. And uh, many years later, as a matter of fact, I would go to Ga the very country where Alex Haley went in Gambia, West Africa, and go through Jupere Village, the very village where he found his family. But I'll save that, but that's another story for a little bit later on in this discussion. Anyhow, this set my mind afire, and while I was just making other kids mad and wanting to fight and everything, I had a more constructive response out of all of this. My dad, as a matter of fact, wouldn't let me watch Roots unless I did all my homework on time. So he kind of saw what was going on, whereas my mother was afraid of the fighting and violence that would take place in school after something like this, and certainly it did. You had uh, black kids who were beating up white kids who uh, they were blaming for their problems and all that, and then you had white kids who would pick on the weaker black kids like myself, saying, yeah, y'all were slaves, and this is how we used to do you, that kind of thing. It was just a grand mess for these immature young kids. But I, the library was my refuge at that school, and in the library, uh, shortly after Roots came out, I happened to find this book, which uh, one of my favorites to this day, called A Pictorial History of the Negro in America by the great poet Langston Hughes. And it talked deep about slavery and segregation and how all that came to be, as well as the triumphs of the people who who experienced these things and how many of them overcame. And again, all of this set my mind on fire. I was just fascinated by this stuff. And I just kept reading and reading and reading. And then something else kind of interesting happened around this time. In the summer of 1977, I went to the library as I usually did, uh, the Village Library in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And I found a book, I found two books. One was called, uh, one was called a Treasury of American Folklore by B.A. Botkin, and another was Mules and Men by Zora Neale Hurston. And these books were filled with the folklore. The B.A. Botkin book told the stories that were passed down traditionally in American folk culture, like Rip Van Winkle and Paul Bunyan and Pico Spill and Johnny Appleseed, things that I had sometimes seen on the Walt Disney show. But I got to read these original tales and about Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett and all, and 
these original stories, and it opened me up to the folklore of the United States of America, saying, wow, there's really something to these stories. And But Mules and Men by Zora Neale Hurston in particular, that was powerful to me because these contain, this book was where Zora Neale Hurston, the great black anthropologist, went to Eatonville, Florida, her hometown, and she sat on the porch of a man named Joe Clark and listened to these elderly black men tell all these fascinating folk tales that have been passed down from us since slavery as a means of not only entertainment, but a means of a coping strategy through the segregation days, as well as a way to pass down folk wisdom. For example, there was a tale in there she told in the book about how there was a fellow who was working in the cotton fields during slavery, and he looked up in the sky and he saw these letters that said GPC. So he jumped out of the field and said, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And this older man looked at him and said, Boy, what's wrong with you? And he said, Look up there in that sky. God's giving me a vision to get out of this cotton field. See, look up there in the sky. See, it says GPC. You know what that is? That's God's way of telling me to go preach Christ. And the elderly man looked at the younger man and said, fool, that doesn't say go, go preach Christ. It says, go pick cotton. And I was like, whoa. And that amazed me because I heard that very same story from my mother and other old people. And it made me realize these are not just stories that my parents are telling. This is part of this great tradition of folklore that use these stories as a means of entertaining as well as educating people on the right and the wrong thing to do in history and such. And so I kind of became a little mini celebrity by going to my friends' houses. I particularly remember a Reed family, a young man named Vincent Reed who had a brother named Alexander who we called Batman, and there was a sister named Shelley. I would go over there to their house and I'd tell them these stories and they'd gather around me and they were fascinated by this stuff. And little did I know, that that would prepare me for public speaking. So anyway, I went to high school, Wando High School, and my time there was largely uneventful, except for I had one mentor, a Mr. Harold Brunson, who taught 10th grade. He had me to, he had me to enter this Black History Quiz competition, and I managed to win by, in some cases, I was sometimes the only person who was answering the questions for our team, Wando High School. So that gave me probably my first brushes of success. But And so this gave me a little bit of attention. It made the yearbook, but it didn't, uh, it didn't lead to much into what I wanted to do with my life. I just really wasn't sure. So when I went to the University of South Carolina, I was just so glad to get away from this community where I felt that the people didn't understand me and such, that I was majoring in business management because it was offered to me, but I had no real aptitude for it. My father died in my, the second semester of my freshman year, February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1984. But a good friend of mine named Russell Benjamin, who I met when I was there, he told me about a Dean Willie Harriford who taught a black history class. Well, I shined in that class. I would go in there and I would just uh, do the tests in five minutes and walk out and everybody's still working on their test. I was always answering questions to what he was saying and so forth. And one day he came over to me and said, have you figured this out yet? I said, excuse me? Dean Halford told me that, don't you see you have an aptitude for this and you should teach this? And it, that was my epiphany. I realized that this was what I wanted to do with my life because they had the Thomas Cooper Library at the University of South Carolina, and I would just go there for fun and read, old, read books on black uh, history, include, you know, as well as other history along with black history, and look through old magazines and newspapers and things like that. And I was getting all these stories that other people didn't know. And what really fascinated me was the days of re reading about Reconstruction. When you had all the, after the end of slavery, they passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that gave black people the right to vote and the right to become citizens and such. And you had black politicians that were largely forgotten for many years. People like Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback in Louisiana. He was governor of Louisiana, a black man. 
1872, and he was also the co-founder of Southern University in New Orleans, and, uh, excuse me, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You also had people like Alonzo Jacob Ramsier, who was a black lieutenant governor of South Carolina from 1870 to 1872. He was followed by another black man named Richard Howell Gleaves, who served from 1873 to 1877, and he, was a, and he served under a Jewish governor named Franklin Moses. First time that happened in the United States. And at the University of South Carolina, I was really amazed to look through a book about the University of South Carolina and saw that during Reconstruction, it was the only desegregated school anywhere in the South in the 1800s. Did you know they had a black professor by the name of Richard Theodore Greener, who I believe was the first black man who graduated from Harvard? Today, his statue was right next to the Thomas Cooper Library, where I learned about all these things some 40 years ago. And... I was just amazed by these things, and I kept getting deeper and deeper into it. But then uh, my mother took a turn for the worse some years after my dad's death. So after graduating, I had to come back down to the Charleston area. But I decided then that I would do something with what I learned. One of the first things I did was I went to the black radio station in Charleston, WPAL, and I told them I could do a black history show. Well, the gentleman down there, who shall be nameless, sort of gave me the runaround. But then I went to the Coastal Times newspaper that was run by uh, Congressman James Clyburn and his daughter Mignon. And they allowed me to do a newspaper column called It's Like This, where I commented on the social scenes as well as these black history stories. And that got me some recognition. One night I was in a Burger King um, joined a double cheeseburger, and this black policeman came in there and said, hey, are you for them? I'm like, uh, yeah, wondering what did I do? And he smiled and shook my hand and said, you're doing us proud. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and, so, and so I was asked to speak at schools and such. And then it was after this that the general manager of WPAL called me and wanted to know if I would occasionally do black history segments for the station. And I did, and I also did some sub-hosting for a talk show called The Drive Time Dialogue and such. And so along with uh, Representative David Mack, and that was a very enjoyable experience. And all of these things helped me a lot. But then in 1994, Dr. William Marvin Delaney, today the president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He was over the Avery Research Center, and he read my things and asked me if I wanted a job as a researcher, and I certainly took it, needless to say. So, again, I was like a kid in the candy store. I was reading all of these. I was helping people do research, and I found all these fascinating things about black history, and one in particular a uh, Dr. David Blight out of Yale University came down and wanted to know if this was it true that black people performed the first Memorial Day in Charleston. Well, I found a newspaper from May the 5th, 1865, telling that very story, and that's how that story came out. Along with, along with these, and I would just collect all these things that other people didn't know, and I wrote about them, and then in 2007, I decided to publish a book filled with these sto stories that people didn't know called True Stories of Black South Carolina. Among them was the story of how Porgy and Bess was inspired by the real life adventures of a disabled black man in Charleston named Samuel Smalls and his girlfriend Maggie Barnes uh, from an incident where they were in altercation on March the 22nd, 1924. I also did the story about, I interviewed uh, Mr. Herbert Fielding, a local politician, about what happened when Martin Luther King came to Charleston on July the 30th, 1967. I also interviewed people who knew Charleston's own version of Dr. Martin Luther King, Mr. Esau Jenkins, and his story really fascinated me. He was a man with a fourth grade education who owned numerous businesses from Charleston to Atlantic Beach, South Carolina, as well as being a colleague of Dr. King dealing with voting rights and civil rights and so forth. And he was killed in an automobile accident when I was eight years old. 
This story really fascinated me because I figured if people knew that a man with a fourth grade education could do all of these things, imagine it would how it would inspire people who had even more education and came from better background to do even more and better. And so this is where I really understood what understood why these type of things were so important because many people came to me and during this period and told me how these stories had inspired them and how it had challenged the beliefs about how they were limited in their mentality and their thinking and so forth. And this is and this is one of the and it also helped people who were not black to understand that situation and was also able to inspire some of them too. And so I was very pleased with all of this. Now, shortly after that book became did quite well, I did another one called Voices of Black South Carolina, which came out in 2009. And this one largely dealt with Reconstruction, among other things. This is Robert Smalls on the cover. Robert Smalls, for those of you who don't know, he, during slavery, he sneaked himself and the rest of his enslaved family aboard a Confederate ship in Charleston Harbor called the Planner, and he sailed them off into, out, he sneaked them on the boat, and he they sailed into Union-occupied waters and freed his family. Now, what a lot of people don't know, is that during this Reconstruction era that happened after that, January the 23rd, 1868, he got up when they were planning the Reconstruction Constitution of South Carolina and said, resolved, all children between the ages of seven and 14 must attend public school at least six months a year under penalty of noncompliance. So here you had a man born in slavery and he was largely responsible for the foundation of the public school system for the state of South Carolina during Reconstruction. Do you know what difference that would make to the minds of so many people who only know what they what little they are told? Yeah. So this book did very well. It also told the story of Miss Septima Clark, a lady who I saw when I was a teenager uh, in a parade that they had in Charleston. It was called the Goodwill Parade. It was a black parade where, where I remember her float came by and she was wearing a queen's outfit and the crowd was going, Miss Clark, Miss Clark, and people were walking up just to touch that float that she was on. And in doing research, I learned that it was largely because in 1956, she was fired from her school teaching position because of her civil rights activities. And she went throughout South Carolina, not, not just South Carolina, but throughout the deep South under Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And she taught illiterate black adults how to read and write so that they could register to vote and take charge of their lives. And she came back and sued and won her right for her lost years of teaching. She got the money back and she was a member on the school board and such. So I wrote that story and, I, and it just occur, it occurred to me, here I was actually in striking distance of this person. So with all of these things, I became an adjunct professor of history after getting my master's. And I would teach young people these things and it would often really make a difference. I showed one class a clip of a man who would later, I would later befriend and who would mentor me, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, who is now known for his television program, Finding His Roots. I showed them a YouTube clip of Dr. Gates when he went to Mali in West Africa in the city of Timbuktu to a school that was over 700 years old where people where Africans were taught how to read Arabic as well as science and astrology and all. They found these old writings that went back over six and 700 years. And one young lady in my class cried when I showed her that. And I told her, I'll come here after class and, and we'll talk about this. And I asked her, well, why'd you cry? And she said, all her life she had been told that they were nothing and to see something like that, and she didn't have the words to articulate it, but I understood what was going on with that. So not too long after that, I wrote a third book called Mr. Potts and Me.
Uh, earlier, I was telling you about Mr. Walter Snipe. Well, that's him behind an eight an eight year old version of myself, and it it was basically loosely based on my relationship with him and my dad. It was about this lonely, awkward bookworm of a boy who's called Lucas Moore in the story, but of course he's my doppelganger. And he befriends this old man who teaches him all these stories about history and, uh, and life lessons and folk tales and all that, based on the stories my dad told me. And the book turned out, uh, you know, I wasn't always, I wasn't entirely happy with the editing, but the book served its purpose because some years later, there was a young lady on Facebook who was writing about how her daughter was bullied in school. So I reached out to her and I gave her a copy of this book. And knowing that there was another person that went through some of those same experiences really inspired her. And now she's been all over television. This young girl has been all over television, recognized as a young, op um, young entrepreneur for making these uh, ice cream treats and things like that only when she was just a little over 10 years old. So I was very pleased with that, needless to say. And then I, and then not long after that, about very recently, I wrote my most recent book, The 1895 Segregation Fight in South Carolina. Now, this story I love in particular. I used to, one of the things that I did in research was I went through old newspapers. And one of the main things that I love to do with old newspapers was find the stories that nobody else knew about and then write about them and speak about them in a way that it would do some constructive good for the present. Well, I found this story through the old Charleston News and Courier and Columbia State newspapers about how, I remember earlier I was telling you about how these black legislators did all these great things during Reconstruction. As it turned out, you had the red shirts and the Klan and groups like that that had such a backlash against those things that the federal government ended Reconstruction in 1877 and that began a long slide of the reduction of black people's voting rights, as well as the slide into segregation. Well, Benjamin Tillman, one of the leaders of the a red shirt group called the Sweetwater Sable Club, and who bragged about killing black people, he became our senator in 1894. And, he, and this was after, as governor, he sent a black man named John Peterson to a lynch mob. And... He proposed that the state re throw out its progressive reconstruction constitution and replace it with a constitution that made segregation the law of the state and reduced black people's right to vote. Guess what, folks? As it turns out, there were these six brave black leaders who were largely forgotten by history, and their names were as follows. Uh, Thomas Miller. Oh, here they are. They are as follows. Uh, Robert Anderson, a teacher from Georgetown, uh, Isaiah Reed, a lawyer from Beaufort, uh, William J. Whipper, who was a lawyer here in Charleston, the great Robert Smalls we discussed earlier, uh, James Wig, another lawyer from Beaufort, and Thomas Miller, who was the founding president of South Carolina State University. These six men, when they tried to segregate the state, those six men went to the State House in Columbia at great risk, under great threats, and made their case before the world as to why this should not be done in the most eloquent of language. Thomas Miller got up and said, Call us aliens, we who have helped build this country, we who have turned, the, we have mined this fields into gold and have sent sparkling water down through the waterfalls, call us aliens. If we, sir, are aliens, then who should the term citizens apply? And William J. Whipper said that the Negro will rise, crush us as you may. The Negro will rise, do what you will. But the car of Negro progress cannot stop forever, for it is not the natural order of things. Whoa! But these men made it clear, their opponents, that the reason they were doing all of this was that they wanted to restrain the black population into a permanent class of cheap labor. And one of their ways in doing that was convincing the poor whites, who they also kind of oppressed, that the blacks were their enemies. Because one of their biggest fears, I learned, was that if the poor blacks and their squat, poor whites 
in their squalor and misery, so found, realized their commonality with the struggling blacks. They feared that these poor whites and blacks would come together and overthrow the rule of the wealthy white planters who ruled them both. So to prevent that from happening, they gave the poor whites more privileges and passed laws in their favor over the blacks. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, divide and conquer of the poor so that the rich can stay rich. And that's what racism is all about, Charlie Brown. And when you understand the reason behind this type of thing through the study of history, it makes a whole lot of difference. So this is where it stands right now. This book is doing well, and I also do a YouTube channel called The American Storyteller, where I bring up these little-known stories and all that to plant seeds in people's minds to make them think. And it's especially necessary now. One of the good things about studying history is that it gives you sometimes answers to the questions that the present is looking for now. One of the things that I learned in studying history is that John F. Kennedy was supposed to give a speech in Dallas on November 22, 1963, in which he warned of the rise of conspiracy culture. He said that we cannot expect that all politicians can talk sense to the American people, but we can hope that fewer American people will listen to nonsense. George Washington, in his farewell address, once warned that political parties would lead to the dividing of the American people where they would place more loyalty to party as opposed to country. Okay? Martin Luther King, in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here?, warned Americans against answers that don't answer, solutions that don't solve, and explanations that don't explain. He said that results when you have no program, no concrete goals to follow and such. And all of these things, all these things are questions that people are trying to find answers to now. And right now, there is very little in the way of leadership or coherent goals or strategy or the type of uh, leaders with the necessary charisma to, lead, to inspire Americans and lead them away from all the nonsense and confusion of our times. But, you know, I've come to understand that if you study this kind of history, and, by, and I mean history, period, not just black history, but when you study history, you learn how you get these ideas that you may not get in the present, and you can synthesize them to make a better future. Case in point. Very recently, I made a visit to West Africa, and I met uh, Usman Seme over at the, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, over at the West African Civilizations, uh, excuse me, the West African uh, Cultural Research Center over in Dakar, Senegal. And this man told me something really deep. He said that he went, ironically, to my hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina, and he, where he taught for a while at Wofford College. And he taught the students there black history. And the students said, said, Dr. Semi, please come back and stay here with us. And he said, no, I have to go back to my home country. But he said, but listen, he's told them, it's good for me to leave now because I have given you the tools to find the information that I taught you for yourselves. That's wisdom. He also... Also, I met um, the chieftains of the Mandinka and Fulani tribes while I was there, had an amazing conversation with them. I met some of the Kinte clan in Jufare over in, uh, over in Gambia, West Africa, where Alex Haley once walked. And I spoke to all of these wise people there. And the reason that's important is because had I not read as a young person, that Africa was more than what the media made it out to be, this haven of poverty and ignorance, I would not have been receptive to going over there and learning from these wise people and their wisdom, which really helped. And I told them when I got back to America, I would tell the truth about Africa and how it really is over there. Because, because you see, when it, you can see, the thing is, whenever you speak to another person, especially a person of another culture, you learn something that you wouldn't have learned elsewhere. 
And I think that right now this is really important because right now you have a situation where anybody can get on YouTube and put any type of nonsense out there. And if it appeals to people's emotions, they believe it using the simple old formula of find out what they want to hear and tell it to them. And they got it made financially and making a name for themselves. One of the things that I've tried to do with all of this is to take all of these things that I've learned, not only to be interesting and to inspire people, but also to t about almost everything that I've done, I've told people where I have gotten the information that I've used so that they could go back and read these things for themselves and even learn more than what I have told them. So because of all of this, uh, I did manage to find my biological family in Spartanburg uh, by 2002. And the, because of my accomplishments in history, they gave me the key to the city back in 2001. And during my last birthday, I was up there enjoying my birthday with my family. And the current uh, African-American mayor of Spartanburg came in and wished me a happy birthday. And we agreed to stay in touch and so forth. And the South Carolina House of Representatives has awarded me with, for my accomplishments. And I've also gotten to meet a number of people who I've long admired. I got to sit down and have a good conversation with the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who inspired me as a boy. I met President Obama back when he was a senator. I had a good conversation with him. I met President Biden a couple of years ago. I had a good conversation with him. I got to participate in a documentary where I spoke with President Jimmy Carter and such. And had I just gone by what people told me as a boy that I was this oddball who was wasting my time re uh, by uh, reading and such. None of that would have happened, you see. So a couple of takeaways I want you to get from all of this. Number one, uh, this is originally being presented to a history class, but so it tells you the kind of good that can happen when you study history. But I hope this, I hope this inspires you to follow your dreams in life. And that if you're good at something, the way to real success is to make, be able to make a living doing what you enjoy. Among other things, I give a walking tour about Charleston's Black History, too. And that's gone pretty well. I've managed to meet a lot of people through that. And oh, yes, I also had the pleasure of having an audience with Dr. Henry Louis Gates himself. Back in 2019, I did a presentation with, in Beaufort, South Carolina, that he attended and we embraced on the stage and had dinner after that. And he gave me this some brilliant advice on a number of things. For example, he told me how people complained initially that his show was dealing not, with nothing but black people. And he came to realize that in doing the histories of not just black people, but the history of others, it broadened his view of the world as well as history and add it to his storehouse of knowledge, okay? So that's also very important too. And, but the most important thing out of all of this, I think, is that over the years I've taught, uh, for about 25 years, I've taught a whole lot of young people. I've told them things that they didn't know before. I've kept up with a lot of them. Some of the young people I've taught have grown, gone on to do pretty great things for themselves. And that's the legacy. I told you earlier about Dean Willie Harford, my mentor who got me in all, all this for the first place. Well, the, one of the things he used to tell me was the best way to reward me is to fi find a young person who was as confused as you. And you help them on their way and you encourage them to help somebody else. So I'm going to conclude this by something that I uh, wrote to be read at Dean Harford's funeral that I got from the legendary Marcus Garvey that went like this. Basically, you want to make it a situation so that, that you do your job in inspiring young people and helping to make things better for them and so forth, that you do, that people will say of you as they said of Marcus Garvey. The story goes that Marcus Garvey was being taken away to jail on trumped up charges of mail fraud in 1925. And this was after he inspired uh, people from around the world to the goodness that was in Africa and how the people of African descent should unite. 
And somebody is said to have called out to Mr. Garvey, I see their cage, the tiger. But as they were leading him away after the person said, he looked back and said, they may have caged like the tiger, but my cubs are running loose. So I say in conclusion that make sure that with your life, when it comes time to meet your maker and they cage the tiger, make sure you leave, make sure to it that the cubs you leave behind through your advice and through your passing of knowledge, that they're going to run loose and keep that knowledge going. This is Damon Fordham.